Hi, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever time it is where you are at right now. Um, my name is Joanneke Weermeester. And I'm Nastasia Gifjo. And welcome to another GEM session uh, where we invite experts from all over the place, design, arts, uh, mental health and industry, to talk about the complex interaction between digital media and well-being. And uh, yeah, so these GEM sessions are the result of the work that we've been doing in our lab, the GEM lab, the Games for Emotional and Mental Health Lab. It's a mouthful. Um, and at the GEM lab, we strive to research and develop ways in which digital tools like games can improve young people's mental health. And um, yeah, so before we start today's session, uh, I first like to go through some housekeeping points. So uh, um, yeah, in a couple of minutes, our guests will be starting uh, by giving a short presentation. And after that, we will open up the floor for some questions. So if you have a question that you would like to ask our guests, please post it in the chat and we'll try our best to get it answered. Um, also be mindful that all of our GEM sessions, including the chat window will be recorded and they'll be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to be doing this GEM sessions and we really value your input as well. So um, we also want to know what you think about the GEM sessions. So at the end of the session, we also will send out a link to a three question survey. Uh, so you can just tell us what you think about the GEM sessions and if you have any ideas of what you'd like to see us talk about next. Yeah, so um, today's guest, as you can see, is the wonderful Rachel Coward, a globally recognized researcher on the uses and effects of digital games. Um, she's also an award-winning author and a science content creator with her own, with super jealous, popular YouTube channel called, called Sidegeist. Um, yeah, and so in this gem session, uh, Rachel will talk to us about her journey from academia to public-facing advocacy work around games, and how each of her uh, each area of her career has informed the next. And uh, following this, she will be taking an open Q and A from the audience about her work, academic endeavors, and current advocacy work, including content creation. Um, so yeah, welcome, Rachel. We're very excited to uh, to have you here with us today. Thank you having me I'm so excited to be here with you guys yeah yeah the floor is all yours oh well I shall share my screen um yeah so thank you for the lovely introduction I am going to talk today briefly about my journey of breaking out of the ivory tower and becoming what I often like to say is a recovering academic <laughs> um, but I'm happy to take questions afterwards about this about my journey about mental health and games which is my jam. I also have kids. We can talk about babies. Um, you will likely hear my baby. So I can't control that. Um, so as a researcher, I think a lot of times we get the sense that academia is the only way forward and the only opportunity for us. And I wanted to take the time to share my story today about how I forged my own way and made the transition from academia to a more front-facing job that really gives me the opportunity to share scientific knowledge with broader audiences um, from science to society, though it is still science, uh, both with my work at Take This and with my content creation. Uh, so here's a little bit more about me. Um, if you're not familiar, I am a research psychologist. So I have a master's in counseling psychology, but I have a PhD, um, a research-based PhD that I got at the University of York in England. I am the research director of Take This, which is a mental health nonprofit uh, that works with both the gaming industry and gaming communities. I also live on Twitter, <laughs> where I do a lot of ranting about science or bad science, and I do a lot of ranting trying to dispel moral panics um, that we often see creep up in and around games. And I do have a YouTube channel, Site Guys, where I talk about the science of games. I also have three children. I love pugs. And my claim to fame is that I am a Henry Cavill influencer. Um, and I was told if I didn't mention that, then I'm doing myself a disservice. So I had to throw it in there. We can talk about that later too, if you have questions. Okay, so anyway, I started my journey um, in psychology wanting to become a therapist. I always wanted to be a therapist. I went and got my bachelor's in psychology. I knew if I want to do something in psychology, you need more than one degree. So I went to go get my master's in counseling psychology. When you do that, obviously you have to do therapy. That's part of, of the program. And I was seeing lots of parents, parent after parent after parent, all kind of in a short span of time, very concerned about the impact of World of Warcraft. Um, this was height World of Warcraft popularity. And they were mostly concerned about the social impacts. They say, I see my child and they're in a room and, and they're looking at a computer and they're not talking. And I feel like this is going to have some kind of negative long-term social um, 
disservice, doing them a disservice over time. And when I went to find them information, um, what the research says about this, there wasn't any. There was like two papers from Nikki at Stanford, who was really a pioneer in this field, um, but nothing else. And that's when I realized I wanted to pivot into doing a research-based PhD. I had always been a gamer, full disclosure. I was playing loads of World of Warcraft at the time. Um, so I was a little selfishly <laughs> interested in like, are there long-term negative impacts? Um, so I finished um, my master's and I went to go get a PhD. This was also the first time I realized too that there was a gap between science and society and that information that we keep in the ivory tower, as we like to say, was not making its way to clinicians and to parents um, in a way that I felt like it should. Like what's, for me, it was like, what's the point of doing this if this information isn't getting into the people who need this information who can then uh, use it practically. And I even remember for my PhD interview going on and on and on about, I wanna look at the impact of games at this time, I was saying on adaptive functioning, physical, social, psychological health, that was like my big pitch. But we all know PhDs then become much smaller, but that was my big pitch. And at the end of this hour interview on the phone, one of the people on the committee was like, why? Why does this matter at all? You keep telling me that it matters. And I said, because we need to give this information to the clinicians who are working with them. And there was like a pin drop silence. And then he was like, good answer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I made it through. Um, but it is important and, and it still remains important to this day. You know, I, I went and completed my PhD. I went and got a postdoc. Um, and at this point, so my PhD took four or five years. My postdoc was about two years. And this dynamic was still existing, despite the fact that at this point, there was hundreds of studies looking at the uses and effects of games. And then specifically, I use the example here about violence because that's still like the hot topic. Even still today, that's still the hot topic. Um, and parents are genuinely concerned. There's a lot of moral panic, of course, but we have the information. So why isn't this information coming up? So during my postdoc, I started to think about, okay, what can I do to proactively get this information that I know exists um, and the research that I'm using and get it out to the public? And my solution was this book, The Video Game Debate, which today is actually like the most popular book of the books that I've done. It, it sells more um, than any of the other ones. And it's interesting because when I wrote it, I was like, this is what parents need. It's a book. It's, if you don't know it, it's an edited book. Each chapter is written by um, the expert in their field about the specific debates in and around games. So video game and violence debate is written by Chris Ferguson. Video game addiction is written by Mark Griffiths. Like it, Cheryl Olson did the one on physical health. And I was like, parents are gonna love it. Turns out uh, parents don't have time to read a 100,000 word book. As a parent now, I, I missed the mark on that one, but it's a very good undergraduate textbook. Um, and honestly, the one that I wish I had when, when I was in school, but I guess the research wasn't there yet. So then I tried again and I wrote a parent's guide to video games. And this is basically an abridged version of the video game debate written much, much more plain language, lots of, graphics, lots of like kind of like takeaway sections. And this was better. This hit the mark more in getting that information out to parents. Um, but anyone who's published a book knows that the biggest hurdle of publishing a book is getting people to know that you published a book and then buying that book. Um, so <laughs> we, we're still here. My one book did not change the world. Uh, this was still, you know, the ongoing narrative um, in public discourse. So then COVID hit. Um, and then I was really noticing while well, I had more time, but also, you know, people were playing more games, but we still had this discourse, even though we know games are great for stress relief. So I started a YouTube channel. People don't have time to read, but boy, people have time to, you know, sc scroll YouTube. Um, and honestly, if I knew how valuable these videos would have been, I would have done this so much longer ago, because even things like when people bring up video game and violence debate, on Twitter, as I mentioned, I live on Twitter. I can just link the video. Like here's my 12 minute rant with sources about what we know um, instead of having to like constantly um, repeat myself. So for me, like this really hit the sweet spot of getting the information out of the ivory tower and into the hands of parents and educators and policymakers. And you know, a lot of what I do at Take This as well has been about outreach and education and being able to have this resource at hand, these videos at hand um, has really been 
invaluable. So I just wanted to share a little snippet of my story today, not only to illustrate, you know, how career paths can really wind, um, but also there's other endpoints for you when it comes to being in academia. You can be in advocacy and education or content creation. Um, you are able to break out of the ivory tower and still use those skills um, and all your love for science, because I've never lost my love for science, um, in a way that has tangible impact. Because again, for me, what's the point of spending all of our time and effort in doing this research if the people who could use it don't know it exists or it's written in a way that they're unable to understand? Because we all know that journal articles are not the easiest to understand unless you have a background, you know in science. And honestly, the biggest challenge of content creation for me is, is taking the scientific information and relaying it in a way that's not me talking about p-values and, and stuff. Um, so anyway, I hope this was helpful. I'm happy to take any questions you have about game studies or my work or take this or content creation or my noisy baby who's about to be one in the background. Um, and yeah, that's all for me. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Rachel. Um, I think that was an amazing and super like brief but super clear explanation of everything that you've worked on <laughs> and, and why the motivation behind it is also super um, clear. So wonderful, thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I, I would just like to start with like a nice icebreaker question yes, for you, please. which is just, what are some of the recent games that you've enjoyed? Oh, you know, I am a mom of three, so I don't play too many games, but um, anymore, sad face. I did play Unpacking. I don't know if you guys have played them. I love this game so much. It's a little indie game from Witchbeam where you, there's not a lot of dialogue. There's not a lot of like choices, but you're just unpacking these objects. I think there's over a thousand objects in the game and it tells a story like through the objects. And I was just so touched by this game. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. Uh, I loved it. I loved it so much. You played it, I guess. I, I downloaded it yesterday, so I still have to play it. But I, yeah, I'm very excited about it. And I didn't spoil it. <laughs> it's beautiful and wonderful. And, and I, I loved it. I sat down and I was like, I'm just going to play five minutes. And I sat for two and a half hours and I wow. completed it in one sitting. Like I couldn't mm. walk away. Yeah. I guess it's also but, more appealing maybe to, to play more of these like wholesome or short form games yes. instead of like diving into a big RPG <laughs> Even yeah. though we That's know your game. love of The Witcher. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah uh, you know, my love of The Witcher knows no bounds. Um, and Final <laughs> Fantasy, I wore my Final Fantasy necklace for you today. Final Fantasy is my favorite series of all time, and I love Final Fantasies. But yeah, they're like two, 300 hours to play, which I would wish I could do. Um, but it's just not possible. At this do you point have a my life. favorite Final Fantasy? Six. This is Ultras from Six. Six is my favorite. And I think it's, you know probably because I was younger when I played it and it's like very nostalgic to me it's also a very good game but um yeah do you have a favorite are we Final Fantasy fans no no so I'm actually I kind of you know I've played a lot of Square Enix games but <laughs> the smaller ones like Bravely Default kind of a more of a niche thing but I've loved that yeah. um yeah so the JRPGs definitely JRPGs, those are the best love those <laughs> me too. so we and also you're... talked about um playing a lot of World of Warcraft right so Oh, so much. <laughs> I'm also a World of Warcraft fan. I just want to hear from you, like, what's the bit about that that you love the most? World of Warcraft? Mm -hmm. Oh, I loved endgame raiding. I loved coming together as a team. I loved just, like, the feeling of just trying really hard at doing something as a team and then succeeding. Um, it was so long ago, like, I don't really remember the names of things, but there was a <laughs> particular raid. It was when they became 25 person raid and there was an mm. achievement you can get called, you can get the immortal added to your name if you did all the bosses in this raid, in this right. dungeon and didn't die. And we did it. And I just remembered like the elation of like actually doing it. Like nobody dying the whole time. It's amazing. Um, and see, I even feel it now. You can't put a price on that. Like no. teamwork. <laughs> totally. So good. So I see actually we have a couple of questions from the oh, chat streaming hi. in. Um, so Abela Michela actually asks, so what would you recommend to academics in order to be more effective in um, spreading their work and sharing it? Yes. Um, you know, would making videos do it? Yeah, videos, I, I have found that video is a 
great way. TikTok is actually also a great way. These really short, quick, I, I follow a few psychologists on there who are really good at like just debunking or explaining like little cognitive biases with like cute examples. Um, I think that what is the word that, that there's a buzzword. It's like mobile transition or whatever uh, acquisition is like the future. And if people can scan it and see it on the phone, like that is really kind of the best way to get new eyes on your work. I also think that making the active effort to reach out to media or Twitter again, or LinkedIn, like there are some really good spaces where you can just start that conversation and practice expressing your research and your findings in as few words as possible and without any jargon. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. Sure when I wrote a parent's guide to video games, I wrote it in like a few months and I edited it for over a year because it's not natural to write mm -hmm. <laughs> for like a normal person once you've been in science for so long, you know? Yeah. No, indeed. Um, the the, the yeah. summary at the end of my thesis, which was supposed to be a normal people language, was the <laughs> yeah. hardest part of that thing. Yes. It's so hard. It's, it's a totally separate skill. Like I think because we just taught scientific writing for so long. Um, so yeah, I would say like Twitter is a very good way, um, to get your information out and then videos also videos are great short or long form. Yeah. Cause you said TikTok. that's maybe yeah. more focused towards a younger demographic, but it's good to mm -hmm. start with debunking, I guess, at a young yeah. age, even oh, though absolutely. we as millennials end up are also on TikTok, just so you know, I <laughs> am also on TikTok, but I do a lot more watching than creating. Exactly. Yeah. The, the creating part. <laughs> also have not dared to yeah. back together. Yeah. Even like Instagram, I know that some, uh, for instance, in the, uh, on the Rappard University, they had like a QA and a on Instagram where students could send in their, oh, um, cool. their questions. And then I did some answers in short video form back and oh, they put cool. it on their story. So yeah. I thought that was also already a very, you know, very short and very quick way of just responding to questions and way more. Yeah, I mean, the, the ability for anyone to you know talk to a scientist someone who researches this stuff is pretty incredible right now there's like low barriers to entry to find mm -hmm. us and talk to us so anyway you're outraging yeah it's effective so do you do you make any tiktoks so few Science i've TikTok? made a couple i've made a couple i am on tiktok under site guys you can find me i've made a couple awesome um but i it's i think that um long form videos that I can run through iMovie and more heavily edit is kind of where my sweet spot is, but mm. I have made some. <laughs> totally get that. We should do a duet uh, sometime yeah, soon though. Totally. Yeah, 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 that would be fun. <laughs> it's also a process of finding out like kind of where your own comfort zone ends. Yeah. And yeah. Where you Everyone has a niche, right? Like, like I said, there's, I can't remember her name right now. I follow a psychologist. She's older than me. She's a developmental psychologist and she I makes the best. I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? She makes the best TikToks. Yes. Just debunking um, straight up, just a yes. very, yeah. I think we are talking about the same person. Yeah. So yeah, so like for her, that's clearly her niche and her jam and she's so good at it. Yeah. Um, I like, you know, long form <laughs> essays with citations. That's that's more me. No, but you still do a great job of actually making it super understandable and clear yes. and like low hanging fruit for people that it's not, you, know, you don't have to reach too far, which is I yeah. think important. Yeah, it's a challenge, but I do try. So thank yes, you. definitely. <laughs> So to, to stay in that science communication vein, um, I see that we have another question from a viewer, uh, Marlou Popolars. She, um, she's, first of all, she said very inspiring. <laughs> um, she also asked, so what kind of audience do you think you are reaching with your YouTube channel? And do you have a sense of which topics seem to draw the most attention? Oh yeah, great question. Um, my audience, I think is largely actually game players. I did create it with the intention of the audience being more, parents perhaps mm. but um it does seem to be people who have an interest in games and know something about games but i guess that makes sense because that's my community right so it, it has to grow from there um the topics i my first year of content creation i mapped out the entire year and it was like what are the most common questions i get this is what i'm going to make videos for addiction violence whatever um and I find that the state of the research videos, so the ones that kind of say, this is everything we know about the topic are the most popular, which makes sense because it's the most detailed, but they also take the longest to create because Absolutely. you have to write yeah. entire scripts for that. Those are by far, I would say the most popular. Although I did start making new content this year. I have a new show called Reaction Time where me and my colleague, Dr. Sarah Hayes, who's a licensed clinical psychologist, watch portrayals of therapists 
on, on television. And we talk about how bad they are. Um, and <laughs> that's been really fun to make. And, and the intention of making that show specifically was not just because this is what I normally do in my living room, which, which is true, um, but is to bring in more audiences. Like this is something that everyone can relate to. Everyone's watched Frasier, right? What do we really think of Frasier as psychologists? And then maybe stay for the science once I've like reeled them in. So, you know, with content, you really have to kind of diversify. There's different audiences who are going to like different things, but yeah. yeah. But do you ever get someone who's like, no, I think that's pretty much what my life is like or <laughs> my job. <laughs> uh, I get one. I not yet. So I've only done two, two or three of those reaction time videos are up right now, but I do get comments sometimes on like my science videos and they're like, I don't agree. Mm. and it's like it's not an opinion if this is just research like a lot of times people I have been accused multiple times of being someone who's just like games are great and they're all good and I don't know how to better reiterate that I just say what I see like when I went into this for my PhD I 100,000 percent expected to find negative impacts Mm. on social outcomes for playing games because every parent was saying it the moral panic was feeding into it and it wasn't there. And the more research you look, you see, oh, well, the effects of media are very small. Um, it's more positive than negative, really, when it comes to the uses and effects of games. So somebody the other day actually told me like, oh, well, you'd say that because you think games are great. And I was like, I have no opinion. What I am presenting to you are facts. <laughs> so if your opinion, you disagree, that's fine. You can yeah. disagree, but that's not what the research says. Hmm. I think I, I might not be able to resist the the temptation to get very sassy with people if that happens. You have to. It's the end. Yeah, it's that's true. Do. Yeah, <laughs> you have to just be like, okay, move on. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just wondering. We've talked a lot about some of the hurdles or what's difficult about it, but what are the things that have brought you the most joy in doing things like this and making your YouTube channel or stepping outside uh, of the ivory tower? Yeah, I love talking about science I love sharing what I know and if I can you know help inform one person more about hey you know it's not cool to think all girl gamers just play the sims or hey you know this game is not turning my child into somebody who's going to be more violent and with a greater propensity to commit crime that brings me so much joy to know that okay maybe at least one person can see this and maybe their opinion will change about, you know, how games are used as tools in our, in our daily lives. They're not, you know, the cause of everything bad. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine even maybe getting a comment that says, oh, wow, I just changed my mind about this, or I've never thought about this before. Because you don't really get that, I guess, often when you write a paper and you send it out there and maybe at some point someone will email you and go, I liked your paper. And then it's like, Oh my god! Right? Yeah. Someone yeah. read it. Oh my yeah. god! Someone actually made a comment the other day and uh, about something, and I was like, "You watched my YouTube?" Video? <laughs> I was like, "Wow!" Like even somebody watched it. Somebody you, watched you do it. know that you have thousands of subscribers, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's still a surprise. It's still a surprise that anybody's <laughs> listening. Just like with your papers, you know, someone writes and says, "I liked your paper." That is a rare occurrence to happen, at least for me. But it, it's it's like, oh, somebody read what I wrote. That's cool. I yeah. spend a lot of time on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I guess the, the, the struggle that I've had a lot is trying to, well, especially when, when talking to media or things like that, there's no real place for nuance. No, <laughs> right. The press or in things like that. They want, right. you know, something short in the title and then yes. trying to steer it towards that uh, way yeah. of, so like, I was just wondering if, you know, there's also, um something that you've done like a course or something on, on uh, you have like science communication classes right? right would you say that's useful or would you think okay you learned it more by doing just like gaming as kind of trial and error um <laughs> i am not going to say science communication courses are not helpful i haven't been to a helpful one but i'm sure there are helpful ones that exist uh, <laughs> i learned i learned more from doing and talking to parents and and realizing you know they don't know what it means to say, you know, the social identity is different from your individual identity and gamer. Ident- they don't get that, right? You just have to mm-hmm. say like being a gamer, you know, comes with a sense of community and it can give people a sense of value. You know, you just have to learn through doing, I think. When you see the glossed over eyes, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You got to change your language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, oh, oh no, I'm not. I have that with lectures with students as well. You, you see. Right. Yes. 
And then you're like, okay, no, there's I've no, lost them. no lights. You can tell. Yeah. yeah. You can yeah, tell. You can tell. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very nice. Um, <laughs> let's see. I wanted to know. Um, oh yeah. I guess we have a, another question in the chat. Yes. Um, from uh, Hanneke Scholte. Uh, she says, thanks a lot, Rachel. Um, what would be your number one advice for parents who are worried about their children's screen time? Yes. Great question. Uh, screen time is a terrible metric. Uh, will be where I would start. <laughs> what are they doing with the screens? Um, my number one advice is all things in moderation. And uh, at the end of the day, if games are the worry specifically, the research says the effects of games are more positive than negative and at the very least neutral. The things that we should be concerned about Oh, our screens went all funny. Um, the, we lost we lost one of our team. Um, the things we should be concerned about are, you know, eye strain, sedentary lifestyle, um, speaking to strangers online, the concern about the effects of the media itself. You know, media has very low impact on our on our behavior short or long term. So don't need to be too concerned about that. But shouldn't be staring at screens all day for sure. No, I know we also often say like, well, you could also just start a conversation a bit more with your child. Like, what are you doing on there? Why are you doing that? What is, what is, why is this so fun to you? Or like, maybe try and play with your kid if they're open to that. Yes. yes. I mean, I love that advice. I always say play with your kids and, and my parents never, ever played with me. So I get that some people just don't want to cross that bridge, but yes. What are you playing? You know, easy. Just what are you playing? Who are you with? That's cool. Tell me about it. And showing some interest and, I use this analogy a lot, but I stand by it. If you can sit through a three-year-old soccer game, it's not fun. You can talk for three minutes about your kid about Minecraft. Like you could do it. I have faith in you. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess there's, there's more and more uh, smaller games that are coming up that are more like couch co-op games that are yes. a bit more. I, I wish that they, that would speed up a little bit more that it's like games where the level, it doesn't really matter as much as if your experience. I know there's some... Mm -hmm. Um, what is it like? Like Trine, that is one of well, it's, it's a multiplayer game where if one of them is not really keeping up as much, it doesn't really matter because at some point you'll just right. revive yeah. them and they're back in the team again. Then you all have different strengths. Yeah, and, uh, I can imagine, especially for parents, it would be so fun to have more. Definitely, I mean, they're getting better at that. Like Mario Galaxy, the new Mario Galaxy um, has Nabbit, right? And Nabbit's a little character, and he can't really oh, yeah. die. Um, so I have a four-year-old, so that's like the perfect for him. Otherwise, he gets very frustrated. But don't play Overcooked. <laughs> mm. Learn that from experience. Seven-year-olds and Overcooked with adults um, just cause family arguments. <laughs> but there are a lot of good coach uh, couch co-ops to play. Well, yeah. I mean, even with uh, 30 year olds, they Those, <laughs> Those overcooked is, I love the game. Overcooked, I love the game. It's just, it, it's yeah. caused a lot Same. of tears in my house. <laughs> if you want to test your relationship to the fullest. Yes, exactly. that or Mario Party. That is. Those tests Forget IKEA. Furniture building is no longer the standard. <laughs> no. It's overcooked. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I don't know. Um, yeah, I just uh, froze out there for a minute uh, with the internet. But I don't know if you guys already discussed one other question that we had in the chat. Because um, you talked a little bit about already about the parents and yeah. parents being very resistant to the idea mm -hmm. that games might <laughs> be anything other than mm -hmm. harmful or a waste of time. Um, yeah. And one of our viewers, Hanukkah Scholter, she had a question about that. Yeah, we had uh, we, we we talked about that question before. Yeah, yeah. We, right. When you were gone, you dropped off. But yeah, yeah I I was actually also wondering about um, uh, you know, we talked a lot about that that um, addiction and and violence. Those are the topics that come up. Yeah, most still even. Yeah. Um, are there any like new um conversations that are happening that surprised you or that you were like, oh wow, this is I guess a new mm. thing that people are worried about or worried about. Worried about. There's definitely things that um, come up that are not like the old hats, you know. Um, when I took video game debate and made a parent's guide to video games, I added a chapter that wasn't in video game debate about um, sexism and misogyny and hate and harassment in gaming mm -hmm. spaces because that was becoming more topical of a discussion. And then we published the video game debate too last year, the year before, I can't remember. Um, and there were mobile media was a big topic in that Franz Myra actually wrote the chapter on that from Tempore. Um, mm. And loot boxes, loot boxes oh, yeah. um, are big, are a big thing. So, you know, as games continue to evolve, 
we are seeing new debates and new concerns. I would say loot box is a pretty big one now still, mostly because it's still being actively debated, like in terms of a legal sense. But, you know, the old ones still stay. Overweight, yeah. Yeah. addiction, violence. Those, those no, are, we try know. and try. But I, I do right. see that, I guess you, you've said this before, maybe a little bit also when you started your, your YouTube channel during the pandemic, mm-hmm. that this, the conversation shifted slightly, the public yeah. conversation. <laughs> mm-hmm. All of a sudden we saw like headlines saying like, oh, maybe uh, playing games is good for stress relief or mm-hmm. a nice way to connect with people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, they're finally, finally. <laughs> they see the light. <laughs> but it's gone back. Yeah. It's gone back. I know. I like you, was so optimistic. Um, but you know, now we're back to where we were. Nothing yeah. changed. Yeah, just yeah. wondering how we can just keep that, that, that momentum I going. I, I mean, I think... It's moral panic and it comes in cycles, right? So mm-hmm. when VR becomes more affordable and ubiquitous, then they'll be like, oh, those old 3D games, those are fine. It's the <laughs> VR, that's the problem. That's what's that's what's gonna happen inevitably. Do you think that that will happen? Do you think VR will take over the Yeah, the absolutely, I think it will. And then like looking back, they'll be like, oh, it was so silly for us to be worried about, you know, death race when those little sprites are running over those little, you know, dots on the screen. Cause now, but now it's fully immersive. I mean. I've done so many interviews about the metaverse, um, mm-hmm. more than I ever have about my actual areas of expertise. I'm, I mean, I'm kind of an expert now because I've done so many interviews and, and research about it now. Um, but the concern is very much consistently, are people going to forget where they are? Mm-hmm. Are people going to become so immersed in the metaverse that they lose, they detach from reality um, and are unable to differentiate, which is interesting because we have that argument now about the video games that we play, right? When we talk about escapism and, oh, you're escaping into this other world and it's something bad for you and it's going to have negative repercussions. So it's just moving to a new technology. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, you've done a lot of different types of science communication already and what in your experience, what are the biggest hurdles that you've, you know, come across when trying to educate people and state the <laughs> simple mm-hmm. research facts? Yeah. Was it was it a kind of a, a um, you know, not not wanting to grasp it, or were there different hurdles that you ran into? Um, having people who were interested in actually hearing the facts instead of just like supporting their preconceived notions. I, um, I was invited to a panel. This was in the pandemic, but it was a couple years ago and it was about game addiction and the other people on the panel um, were very pro game addiction narratives. One was a, not even a researcher. It was just a person with life experience, not to discredit it. That's fine. Um, Another was a researcher and I did the pre-interview for this panel and I said, well, you know, the research doesn't support that addiction is a standalone diagnosis. There's a lot of contention um, from scholars in the field. There's this open letter, you know, there's this idea it was politically motivated. And basically the person running the panel looked at me and said, yeah, but when the other people are talking, like, you're just going to like not say anything, right? You just... And I was like, no, <laughs> like I, I, I'm going to say something. And basically they're like, you're going to sit there and be quiet and you're going to nod while they say their piece. And so I was not on that panel because I was like, that's not what I'm going to do. So getting people who are actually willing to listen is the, is the biggest hurdle. Cause a lot of people just have their ideas and they just want them to be supported mm. in confirmation bias. Um, so yeah, that's probably the biggest. Yeah. I see that we have another uh, couple of questions uh, in the chat. So from uh, the Dr. B question, what's your favorite franchise and why is it The Witcher? (laughs) Oh, Dr. B, I love you. I love you so much. I love The Witcher. (laughs) Everyone knows this about me. Um, I I love all things fantasy, to be honest, all things RPG, all things that immerse you into other worlds and anything Henry Cavill. So there you are. That's why I love that's it. easy, really. Yeah, they, I mean, it fell. Speaks for also, thank you for that question. Dean. I appreciate it. <laughs> There's more Witcher fans on the on the panel today. <laughs> yeah, Excellent. I'm in good company. Good. Yeah, it's, it's still. I I would say if people would ask me right now, I would still say that The Witcher Wild Hunt is my favorite. Is the top. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's like nostalgic games that I've liked yeah. in the past, and that's you know, that, that are there, like Crash Bandicoot, things like that. I was a PlayStation right. kid when I was younger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now 
definitely that one. But yeah, yeah, like you said, not always the time to really jump into this big immersive world. Play it in chunks, yeah. maybe. You yeah. Know, you find it yeah, definitely. Well. But I find too, like, I was trying to play the Final Fantasy VII remake because I love Final Fantasy. Um, but it takes like at least 20 minutes to even remember what you were doing <laughs> when yeah. you log in. So like, yes. you're just playing chunks, but you need chunks of like hours. You can't just totally. know. Yeah. I, I mean, wouldn't that just be an awesome kind of feature to just get a recap like 30 yes, seconds yes. recap <laughs> what was i doing yeah <laughs> yeah like this yeah. is this is a story this is where you left off mm-hmm. these are like the main things you needed to do for the controls you're all yes. set. So. all right game devs there you are <laughs> yeah. yeah i tried to play um um was god of war again in the winter break and uh, i just forgot I, I knew how to throw the axe but i i spent literally like a couple of minutes trying to figure out how to retrieve my axe again mm-hmm. and i was mm-hmm. too stubborn to look it up and i was like no yeah. one of I'm these working. buttons must do it it just didn't make sense just like throwing yeah. back and forth my axe like yeah. an idiot but yeah it has to be one of them yeah <laughs> one of these trial and error i can do it i can find yeah the right one <laughs> And so um, <laughs> as we're approaching uh, kind of the final stages of our, of our talk with you, Rachel, um, one of our viewers also has a question about any new research or book projects that you're working on. What's what mm. lies ahead in the future for you? Yeah. Um, currently, my work is focused more on the darker sides of games and um, dark participation, toxicity, hate harassment, um, radicalization and extremism, which is what I'm talking about at GDC next week, if anybody's going. So my work is heading more into that direction to try and tease out these these darker elements that exist in our gaming spaces and do some solution focused work. Like, okay, do these exist? How, in which way do they manifest themselves and how can we work together? I'm very lucky to work at Take This because I, I really bridge the gap between industry and community focused work. And I have, I think such an opportunity to get time with people in the industry to be like, this is what we know and this is what we should do. So I'm trying my best to take advantage of that and trying to make games, you know, a better, safer, place for us all. Um, in terms of book projects, there is one. There is one that's brewing. Um, I'm, I am so. writing a book. <laughs> I do a lot of edited books. So the video game debate spawned an, an edited collection, debates and media studies. And this year we're going to see the social media debate come out, which is quite exciting. Ooh. And then next year, the mobile media debate is going to come out and it tackles the big debates the social media one's particularly interesting because it has like sections on disinformation and social media and that sort of stuff um but i'm also writing a new book for parents um with my colleague amanda farrow who is a games journalist um and she's also part of the uh what's a, a podcast, a virtual economy podcast. She's one of the co-hosts uh, called Digital Playgrounds, um, which is meant to be a book for parents uh, about how to navigate these digital playgrounds and, and start to you know change the way we're conceptualizing games, not as like spaces of where bad things happen, but as tools in our everyday lives and it's playgrounds and play is important across all ages, not just, not just kids. Even we're yeah. still playing. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Every chance I get. Yeah, yeah every all day, every day, preferably. Yeah, yeah. right. Great. Whether digital, whether board games, yeah. puzzles, you name it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Even the baby agrees. It's like come play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Firm affirmation. Yeah, <laughs> they teach it young. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so do you get to play often with the kids? I do. I do a lot of. Uh, Animal Crossing through the pandemic, um, and then a lot of Mario Party and Mario Galaxy. So, you know, the Switch is so good for for family-friendly mm. kind of games. But I will say, I got my daughter, she's seven, I got her on Two Point Hospital, and I've never been more proud. I've never been, I mean, her hospital's a mess. There are benches everywhere, but you know what? She's doing it. So love it. Maybe it's a reflection yeah. of reality. <laughs> it I might mean, be everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Bench is everywhere. I want to be able um, to take a nap everywhere. <laughs> that, she's like, there's a ghost in here. I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's part of the game. Yeah. There's actually a two point campus coming out, a university. I version. am so excited. The academic in me, I can't resist. I'm so excited. Yes. Exactly. Like now oh, we can gosh. finally run our own university. <laughs> the ecology yeah. department will have all the funding. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All the equipment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amazing yeah <laughs> is there anything that you uh, wanted to talk about or wanted to share that you hadn't up till now or that you haven't mentioned um 
no, I think we, I think we've had a pretty good conversation yeah. um, about about all things. <laughs> Um, but if any other questions come up, of course, uh, viewers, feel free to reach out. Again, I'm always on I'm always on Twitter. You can always find me. I'm always happy to chat about um, these things. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Rachel. It was really, really a pleasure. And uh, I think we at Gemlab will definitely be in touch with you. It was wonderful to connect. And um, thanks for taking the time to chat with us and share your expertise and all of your experiences. Um, I think many of our viewers can uh, find valuable insights in what you just shared today. Um, so tell us, where can people find your projects? You can find my projects um, at rcohort.com. I usually update that pretty regularly. Um, YouTube, of course, and Twitter. Twitter is where everything, it's where the magic happens. Um, if there's a new project or if there's a talk that I'm giving, um, I, I pretty much always put it there first. Okay. Well, we look Wonderful. forward to seeing all of the things that you'll be doing in the future and all of your new videos. Um, so yeah, if um, also you viewers at home, if you want to learn more about us and what we do as Gem Lab, um, you can check out our website at www.gemlab.com. That's G emhlab.com uh, and uh, you can follow us on all of our socials we're on twitter uh, we're on uh, instagram i guess we're on facebook even though well not many people use it these days um and uh so yeah and if you have some uh, feedback for us about how we can uh, improve our sessions or things that you would like to uh, us to talk about you could put it in the three question survey that we've posted now in the chat so you can go there if you uh, if you have some thoughts that you'd like to share with us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks again, uh, Rachel. Thanks for Thank everyone you. tuning in. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you at the next GEM session. Yes. See you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye.